Okay. <laughs> so while we are uh, at uh, uh, the history of Christianity in Britain and uh, geography, so let's talk a little bit about pilgrimage, Christian pilgrimage sites um, in the uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, I already mentioned a few, but uh, um, there are uh, there are more, and sometimes they go back very very far in history. Uh, so even to pre-Christian times, um, there was a very strong folk tradition in all parts of Great Britain uh, to venerate springs and wells. So we have all kinds of. Um, uh, holy wells. Uh, uh, some of them are connected uh, with uh, saints or they were later connected with saints. Uh, for example, there is a place in, the, in the Northern Ireland called Struel Wells, which is apparently connected traditionally with St. Patrick. Um, probably the most uh, famous and the most uh, interesting um, of these sites is uh, the place called Hollywell in uh, uh, Flintshire in, uh, in Wales uh, which uh, holds uh, what is believed to be the oldest continuously operating pilgrimage site in Great Britain associated with uh, some sort of uh, early medieval or, or even Roman martyr virgin called Saint Winifred uh, or Winefried. Uh, there is a, I, I visited this place, it's very very interesting. It's basically a pool, a healing pool based built on a, uh, on a spring. Uh, the water is cold and you can still bathe there. There are uh, like little changing huts next to the to the pool. Um, I did not immerse myself completely, but I put my foot in this. Uh, the the pool and the chapel connected to the pool are beautiful. They are they are uh, in Gothic style, so it's not like a spa, uh, but uh, like a kind of holy place. And uh, it is interesting because uh, it kind of survived. So uh, unlike very many interesting churches and abbeys um, from the Middle Ages that were destroyed um, during and after the Reformation, either by the, uh, the soldiers of, uh, of the Tudor monarchs uh, or by the Protestant mobs. Uh, this one is probably small enough and uh, set a little bit aside from, from the center of, of operation. Uh, that uh, that it survived. So we have those holy wells. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, some other sites, um, for example, the oldest church in England um, in uh, Essex. It's a chapel in this kind of even pre-Romanesque uh, um, style. It dates uh, probably to the seventh century. And uh, uh, it's in the in the uh, village of Bradwell on Sea. So this is apparently uh, a pilgrimage site. Uh, I mentioned uh, Canterbury. Now, of course, uh, um, for many centuries, associated more with Saint Thomas Becket. Um, I mentioned Bury Saint Edmunds, uh, which is associated with Saint Edmund the Martyr. Uh, but there are also other uh, interesting uh, sites, uh, like, for example, um, Glastonbury in England, the, the ruins of Glastonbury, uh, which were believed to be um, the ruins of, uh, of the church originally established by St. Joseph of Arimathea, uh, so someone who, who knew Jesus personally. Uh, this is a very important place uh, for all the Arthurian stories, for the stories of the Holy Grail. Uh, it is um, uh, a ruin now. Um, apparently, well, again, according to one of the legends, the, 
uh, the church before it was destroyed was established by Saint David, so this Wales, uh, Welsh um, saint. Uh, what else? There are some ruined abbeys that uh, claim to have possessed uh, the most powerful relics in Christianity, so a piece of the true cross or a vial of the blood of Christ. Uh, one such place is uh, in Norfolk, which is the ruins of the uh, of the monastery uh, uh, called Bromholm Priory and um, apparently at some point they possessed a piece of the true cross but there were so many pieces it must have been a giant tree and another abbey, uh, a former Cistercian abbey uh, in Gloucestershire called Hales Abbey, now in the ruins of course uh, it claimed to possess a few drops of the uh, original blood of Christ. Uh, what else? Uh, Lindisfarne, uh, the island of the east coast of, uh, of England um, connected with one of the famous powerful local saints, Saint Cuthbert. Uh, his relics were uh, moved to, to Durham Cathedral, another very important and, and uh, beautifully surviving uh, cathedral in northern, uh, in northern England. Uh, there are some uh, places connected with uh, local saints um, in uh, Wales, uh, in uh, um, uh, in Scotland uh, there is a, a great uh, centre of uh, Scottish monastic life on the Isle of Iona associated with one of the greatest native Scottish saints uh, called Saint Columba. Uh, there is uh, a, a beautiful surviving cathedral in the city of St. Albans, which is dedicated to St. Alban. According to the um, hagiography, he was the first martyr in, uh, in Britain, killed by the Romans uh, um, during the Roman occupation. So he was one of those original early Christians that basically died out, so that uh, Christianity had to be reintroduced um, to, uh, to Britain. Uh, there are um, another great uh, surviving beautiful Gothic cathedral is in Winchester. This was the um, burial place of many Anglo-Saxon monarchs. Uh, it is also associated uh, with uh, yet another Anglo-Saxon saint, the Bishop of Winchester, Saint Swithin. So um, that's, uh, that's it. There are also some places which claim to be associated with apparitions of the Virgin Mary. The most famous of them was Walsingham in, uh, in Norfolk. Um, it was very famous for, for religious shrines. If you go further back in history, you can find lots of interesting information about, uh, um, let's say, religious prehistory on the, on the British Isles. Uh, so especially in Norfolk, apparently this was a centre of uh, pagan tradition, pagan religion. So after Christianity took hold, uh, many of the early medieval churches and uh, monasteries were built there because this is what the Christians would do. They would take an already holy place and Christianize it. Um, they didn't do it with Stonehenge and other um, megalithic sites but um, some places like, like the places on the um, plains and marshes of Norfolk definitely they uh, they did
that. So, uh, if you're interested in uh, um, the history of, uh, of pilgrimage and uh, holy sites in Britain, this is a wonderful subject and you can find lots of um, interesting materials. But let's move on to other national symbols. So, the next symbol that you can see here on the illustration is the, uh, the Royal Coat of Arms, which send, uh, serves as a kind of uh, national symbol as well the equivalent of the Polish eagle. So if you uh, ever try to draw an eagle as a small child, uh, try to think about the English children who try to, um, to draw this design. Uh, the most uh, visible uh, elements are the heraldic beasts, so the lion and the unicorn, and uh, uh, as you can see, uh, they support uh, the central motive with a shield, uh, with uh, um, uh, with a crown and uh, and helmet, uh, um, it looks like they are fighting for the crown. So if you if you recall this uh, little passage, the verse from Alice in Wonderland about the uh, the lion and the unicorn fighting for the crown, this is this is actually a humorous uh, allusion to the. Uh, to the national symbol, to the national um, coat of arms. So uh, we have those two beasts. The lion is one of the most uh, important uh, symbols of, um, of England. Uh, it was the crown in the original uh, image, so he won probably the fight. Uh, and the unicorn which has the crown around its neck uh, and uh, a chain, so perhaps it's kind of enslaved unicorn, is one of the traditional heraldic symbols of Scotland. So this design of the royal coat of arms um, really marks or, or emphasizes the connection between England and Scotland. Uh, the shield in the center uh, is adorned with the images, some more images of lions and this very strange looking harp, uh, which is a symbol of Ireland. And all together they form the, uh, the design of the royal standard. We'll talk about the royal standard in a little moment. Uh, this uh, also is a composite uh, symbol with the elements alluding to England, Scotland and Wales. And they should have included this dragon. They really should have included the dragon. They have everything in this, uh, in this design, so why not the dragon? Uh, but uh, there are some more interesting things here. So around the shield, as you can see, there is this uh, belt-like thing in uh, gold and blue, uh, bearing an inscription, and uh, you cannot see the inscription uh, fully, but we know what it is. It is an inscription in old, Fran uh, in old French saying, On y soit qui mal y pense, which means shame to him who thinks bad of it. And these were the words of King Edward III, the one who introduced St. George as patron saint of England, when he established the Order of the Garter, the highest honour that can be bestowed on anyone by, by an English monarch. Um, we are talking about, uh, uh, about um, the 14th century, so this is not the early Middle Ages, this is, this is a kind of high medieval period. Uh, the period of, uh, of uh, chivalry and, uh, and knighthood and apparently there is a legend about um, the establishment of, um, of the um, Order of the Garter, which I will tell you in a moment, and this belt is actually the Garter itself. It is a now obsolete piece of uh, clothing. This was a little belt, one of the pair of such belts, used to keep the stockings in place. So before uh, they had uh, elastic bands in socks and everybody wore uh, woolen or uh, silk if they could afford stockings, 
uh, you have to somehow secure them in place, uh, so either with some uh, piece of, um, I don't know, rope or, or, uh, or ribbon usually, or with a more decorative garter. And apparently during some ball uh, involving um, the aristocracy, uh, the king uh, was dancing with one, with one of the ladies uh, when suddenly a piece of underwear fell from below her dress and this was a garter. She was dancing so vigorously with the king that she dropped a garter. So you may imagine this kind of um, faux pas and uh, uh, the uh, courtiers started laughing as, at this uh, unfortunate lady, I think it was Lady Salisbury, and the king, being a very gallant man, he dropped, uh, he um, um, took the garter and uh, he said the words in French, as it was uh, then the custom at the royal court, shame to him who thinks bad of it. And he decided to uh, commemorate this event or kind of turn around the meaning of this event from um, an event of shame and humiliation to something very noble and uh, and honorable uh, so he established the order of the garter and we have this emblem of the order of the garter now uh, on the uh, on the uh, royal coat of arms still the other um, motto uh, seen on the uh, on the um, ribbon uh, below the shield and the garter says Die et mon droit. So another inscription in French, yes, French language was very important in the medieval um, court. And uh, basically, well, um, Edward III believed that he is the king of France because uh, his mother was the daughter of a French king and uh, his uh, uncles died. So, uh, according to the English law, the uh, son of the sister should take the throne, but not, uh, unfortunately not according to the French law. Um, so, the Hundred Years' War started. Uh, so, this inscription means God and my right. So, it's like the motto of the monarch uh, that... Uh, they are only answerable to God and their law. Uh, if you look uh, above the, uh, the um, inscription, you have some symbolic plants and uh, uh, I hope you can see the shamrock, so this uh, three-leaved clover associated with St. Patrick. You can also see a, a rose, a kind of flat rose, not the modern roses, but a, a flat rose in red and white, which are the colours of the Tudors combining earlier designs of the Yorks and the Lancasters, so after the Wars of the Roses, when the dispute, the very bloody dispute of the aristocratic houses for the crown was uh, finally resolved by the new dynasty, the Tudors, coming to the, uh, to the throne. Uh, a new design of the rose was, uh, was um, introduced. This is the Tudor rose, the symbol of England. And uh, the third element, the third plant is the sisal, this kind of thorny plant, which is one of the symbols of Scotland. Um, it's a kind of defensive plant, if you think about that. And uh, again, the question is, where is the leek? There should be the leek, uh, the national plant of, uh, of Wales. And some modern designs include the league, but not this one. The same reason why Wales is not present uh, on, the, on the Union Jack and on the Royal Standard. When these designs were first made, Wales was already long um, 
united with England, so much so that nobody wanted to, uh, to emphasize the cultural identity of Wales. Actually, speaking of um, national symbol, of plant symbols of Wales, there is another one, the daffodil, for those who are too delicate to associate patriotic emotions for something as mundane and commonplace as an edible vegetable. So, uh, traditionally it is the leek associated uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Saint David and those uh, soldiers mentioned uh, um, by Shakespeare in Henry V, but also mostly from the 19th century onwards, there is also the daffodil, so something a bit more elegant. Uh, we have uh, a few more things. The next uh, uh, slide shows you the symbolic personification of Britain called Britannia. Britannia, uh, you can see uh, Britannia um, here in this artistic rendition and also on the 50 pence coin. Um, there are different designs of coins, uh, for example um, they, uh, they have the designs with, uh, with the plant symbols, but the 50 pence has Britannia and as you can see there are some elements, so Britannia is wearing a helmet, uh, she's carrying a shield with Union Jack, uh, she's, uh, she's accompanied by a lion and uh, she holds a trident, a trident which is a, a, a kind of traditional symbolic weapon connected with uh, Poseidon or Neptune the god of the seas. So um, Britannia is uh, the embodiment of Britain, uh, a kind of, it's like the French, the French Marianne really. Uh, if you recall the song Rule Britannia, uh, this really uh, alludes to this maritime power of, uh, of Britain. So Britannia ruled the waves. Britons never, never, never shall be slaves. So this is uh, this is perhaps why we have those soldiers here in this uh, in this design. Um, it's one of the popular patriotic songs. Now with a little bit of um, let's say problematic associations with the imperial past of Britain, but still, uh, we have another personification uh, in the person of John Bull. John Bull is a character from late 18th century um, press cartoons or something like that. Uh, he was supposed to embody this kind of pre-industrial country gentleman with um, common sense, not much sophistication, this kind of down-to-earth character who likes his uh, roast beef, who likes his beer, uh, who has this kind of uh, no-nonsense attitude to everything. So sometimes he is um, uh, he is recalled, and you can see uh, two images. Uh, one is uh, uh, from a, a poster from the period of um, of the First World War, and he is used to attract men to join the army. So uh, he is like Uncle Sam, really, in a, in America. And here we have a. Uh, an image showing these two national personifications together, so Uncle Sam and John Bull. Um, he sometimes so, uh, he's sometimes accompanied by a bulldog, so he has a pet dog, but it's a very kind of um, sturdy and not so pretty English bulldog. Um, so uh, that's another thing and speaking of songs of course we have the national anthem God Save the Queen. I would say that the monarchy is something of a national symbol in, uh, in Britain still. Here we have a cartoon from 2015 when Queen Elizabeth broke the record of the longest reign in British history formerly held by Queen Victoria. The King on the third uh, with the third place is George the Third, 
but he was very ill towards the end of his life, so he didn't really celebrate. He, he, um, his reign lasted 60 years, Victoria is almost 64, and Queen Elizabeth II is still going strong and not really planning to abdicate. So uh, this is perhaps a good moment to re, uh, um, remind yourself of the of the uh, national anthem, God Save the Queen. Uh, it is a very interesting song uh, because uh, it uh, was written in France and it was given as a present by King Louis XIV of France to the descendants of, uh, of the Stuarts who were exiled from Britain after the Gro Glorious Revolution. In the, uh, in the 17th century, uh, so they wanted to return, they wanted to, uh, to incite a rebellion and there was a rebellion mostly in Scotland called the Jacobite Rebellion and this song was supposed to be the, uh, the anthem of the Jacobite Rebellion. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the dynasty that was sitting on the throne of, um, of Britain at that time, the Hanoverians, who were only introduced uh, in, the, uh, in, the 18th, uh, uh, in the 18th century, early 18th century, um, when, uh, uh, when the, uh, the, the Stuarts uh, died out, the last of the Stuart uh, dynasty, uh, Queen Anne, died leaving no surviving children so uh, the next thing to do was the parliament asked the nearest protestant relative who was the uh, the king of hanover in germany he was a very distant relative and there were much closer relatives of the stuarts living in france but they were all catholic so they were excluded and this is why the jacobite rebellion um, happened and in the 17th century in the first half of the 17th century you have two generations of those uh, uh, french uh, stuarts trying to get back the, uh, the crown uh, they did not succeed, they were finally completely destroyed in Scotland at the Battle of Culloden. Uh, but uh, the Hanoverians, they loved the tune, so they just took the song, they added uh, some new um, lines to it, like there is uh, uh, this uh, very interesting uh, verse uh, about Marshall Wade, one of the uh, leaders uh, army leaders against the Jacobite liber uh, rebellion. So um, uh, it goes like this, uh, Lord granted Marshal Wade, may by thy mighty aid victory bring, may he sedition hush and like a torrent rush, rebellious Scots to crash, God save the king. So originally it was the king, it can be changed of course. Uh, so um, there are uh, more lines, more verses to this uh, uh, national anthem and some of them are a bit more problematic than the others. Uh, here we have another, uh, another example from 1800. Uh, it's not now um, sung very often because it's uh, clearly uh, about a masculine monarch, so father, prince and friend. Well, friend could be a, um, a woman, but uh, a father, maybe, mother, but a prince. Uh, so um, that's uh, that's it and we continue in a moment.